Today, we're gonna to talk about product photography and bringing those images to life. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. Well, was just Cheers. Finally, we're back. Long time. Haven't seen you guys in a while. So uh, we're going to be talking about product photography today awesome. and um, bringing some stuff to life. So I'd like to introduce everyone first. We have Larry and Brian from somewhere. <laughs> Scott the Hat. And my name is Nick. And we're sponsored by PAC, the Photographer's Adventure Club. PAC has all kinds of cool stuff to do. Photo walks. Um, workshops go check the website out it's uh, photoadvclub.com and there's always something going on near you so product photography we have you guys in a special guest again here um you've been doing product photography how long larry well i landed in it about three and a half years ago oh it's it was like three and a half minutes i'm like yeah well yeah <laughs> it could be you know it seems like that long ago it's just like gone you know these years have just gone by you know lost in a studio somewhere <laughs> yeah so three and a half years ago and you started and you didn't know anything. You had to learn it from the ground up, pretty much, right? You kind of jumped into your new photography, but this was kind of a different angle. You know, I'd always been a landscape photographer, and I started getting interested in portraits and people, but I didn't really want to edit skin back then, and so I just kind of left it alone. And I got an offer to shoot some jewelry from a, in a potentially very large job, and with a friend of mine up in Sedona, I went, wow, you know. You know what, this, this looks interesting, but I, had, I don't know a thing about it. So I started watching YouTube videos and checking things. I found a number of people who taught online. And I went out and bought a shower curtain and one of those opaque white ones. Hmm. I got some of those hardware lights with the silver and we put some bulbs in them. And we got some little LED flashlights to see if we could make the stones pop. We didn't know what we wanted to do. And I built myself a plastic frame and hung the curtains up and popped light and made a great big booth. I mean, I mean, I'm talking a big booth. I've got a piece of jewelry down there this big, sure. and all this light coming in. But anyways, we I began shooting, and about five or six weeks later, I presented an image to the company and they hired us. So uh, I had beat out eight other photographers. So I must have done something right. But there's still an evolution to go after that. It was a shower curtain. <laughs> it was so, a shower curtain. It was a shower curtain. <laughs> well, Scott Kelby talks about it all the time. Go buy the Target's shower curtain. Yep. It's, it's, it was five bucks, now it's 15. So evidently they're getting more popular. They must have caught on to us. So, so, um, so we, photography device now is more expensive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, so we had some problems um, in the studio today. We're in the studio um, shooting a motorcycle, which is bigger than jewelry. But same thing, it's still a product. And yep. what were some of the problems that we were kind of well, digging around and trying to move stuff around? Yeah. So a lot of lines in this bike and uh, this particular bike we're shooting and it's a really ugly bike too I don't know where you where'd you find that <laughs> right thanks I appreciate it my garage <laughs> um, I borrowed it from him <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no I mean the lines and and it's funny because when you when you look at reflection of light uh, and you know the all picture studio and those that haven't been in it I mean there's lights everywhere we had six or seven lights going but you know, a light might be coming down this way, but it reflects back this way. It's sometimes the opposite, but um, you want to make sure that the that the reflection, because you can't go do away with it. You want to make sure that it's following the lines and the curvature of the of the object. Yeah. And this particular bike has a lot of angles, a lot of corners, uh, some you know, kind of a. Yeah, they, well, they was, all do. What, what were we doing? We were lighting a car, right? In one of the model shoots, and same thing. It was like you had a fix all these problems of put a light here and then it creates another problem there. Right. Yeah, put this there and it creates another problem. You put the model yeah. in and it's just one thing after another yeah. we went through with that. Yeah, too. you're just chasing your tail trying to figure out which light source is causing which problem and where, you know. And so when, especially when you're shooting like a car or a motorcycle, right. you've got, you know, upwards of, what you say, seven lights going, sometimes even more. Right. I mean, that's that's a lot of a lot of loose ends to be tracking down. You got to hit each one of those lights to figure out where. So you fixed it that one time with the car, with just putting a scrim in front of one of the lights. So then that kind of. Uh, yeah, we just we knocked it. We we realized there's specular highlights off the you know shiny surfaces. So yep. you know when you get specular highlights, your first instinct is to diffuse it. it. Try to diffuse it. Oh, I put a model in front of it. But then you, you know. <laughs> it's gone. Everyone's looking at the model. They're like, there's a car in that picture? <laughs> what car? Yeah. But, yeah, that's that's usually, you know, you, so there's kind of like a, a methodology to troubleshooting, you know. And so, you know, if something's too specular, you go the opposite end. You try to diffuse it. If something's right. too hard, 
then you try to soften it, you know? And so like you do that with each light source. And so, yeah, it could be kind of a jigsaw puzzle to figure out. Well, and you go out there and, and sometimes you're trying to find it and the angle of uh, reflection isn't, you think it might be coming from here, but it's really skipping off of something back right. there at you. Yeah. So these angles, it's like, I almost think of a pool table and things, yeah. how they're going to bounce and things do things. It's very predictable. But sometimes it's very confusing, especially when you have too many lights and you got to start turning things off right. and blocking things. And then sometimes if it's a big set, you got to go out and have someone go out there and move around there with a hand or a piece of white foam core. <laughs> and you can stand the camera because the only position that matters is what's through the right. lens. Yeah. And so you fix that. But if you're hand holding and you do this, all of a sudden everything's messed up again. So right. a lot of times if it's like the scene like we we're talking today you got to fix that camera you can't just do like a model and move around because that bike is a very specific way it's going to be lit well just like you were talking about moving you know we we're shooting a black bike today you have white lights so the contrast between the reflection and the black bike is obviously the full spectrum of, of... so anyway you've got a we had a thick you know uh, reflective section here but then a real thin so you got to lean over to make them match yeah the line but then i'll but then you've got the model that you're shooting who now you've lost the angle on that person yeah. so, so it's it, just it's, one problem after yeah another. it's very you know and you you hit the nail on the head i mean you're chasing your tail i mean it's a challenge and it's a great challenge and, and you know it's i actually like being here more than thinking about coming in to do it because it's, you know, there's too many things you haven't you, when it's right in front of you, you can start eliminating things one at a time and that's really yeah. what you have to do is just take one piece of it at a time and build in the lights that's what i'm going to say so you set the lights up the the way um that i learned is to just put one on at a time and kind of get them all cued in mm -hmm. get them all lined up like we did the model shoots too to to just incrementally bring them in Right, and that's that's a great thing. Like just an example, just to use a model. I'm, I'm sure you've done this, and you've got some backlighting, a rim lighting, or a hair light, and you can turn everything else off. And I've even taken shots where you just take a shot and you look in the camera, you can see that outline, and then you can go ahead and turn that one off and turn something else and take that shot. It's actually an interesting exercise to go mm -hmm. through, and then start turning two on, then all three of them. In the case of here, six, seven, eight, ten yeah. lights going right. on. You just It's a, just a bigger math problem. Yeah, right. so we do that when we teach people in the classes, too, to kind of to fix that. It, it helps you kind of see where you're wrong because, you know, you just know right off the bat. And then as we turn them all on, you just kind of have to bring them back sometimes, reel right. it in a little bit because mm -hmm. now it's brighter. It's just not the same as just setting a person in there. You, you can learn to light a person, but it doesn't exactly translate out to this shiny object with all kinds of curves. In the case of this bike, it had some hard edges where the line, things would break over. And so, so, so what are some, you know, you do this, you do this full time as a product photographer. Um, so what are some problems that you see, you know, getting away from the jewelry, which is really small, which not a lot of people do that, or the bikes or the cars, mm -hmm. which a lot of people may be doing that, but they're doing them at car shows and different right. things. They're not lighting them themselves, so they can't control that. You know, say like the middle of the road stuff, when you've taught your classes, what are the problems like, say, with wine bottles or glasses or the things that you see that are easy fixes that people just don't think about? Yeah, it's the same issue with the car and the bike is that they'll put a soft boxes up in front on each side or one side and you'll just see that thing right in the bottle and all of a sudden the half the label is cut off and you can't read it. Yep. And the client's not going to like that. They want their label and all their mm -hmm. logo to show. So you've got to make sure that shows. So we take a lot of time to use scrims and diffusing panels and create gradients on those that create a nice shape to the bottle because how do you see shape? It's with gradients and highlights and, and, and darks that, yeah. that transmit across to each other. And, and sometimes things that look shi shiny. Oh, we have neighbors going here <laughs> with dogs. We have a, um, uh, you know, sometimes you need those the highlights in there. They need a white line and a shiny silver object and black lines because that's what tells you that it's shiny. Yeah. So the issue most I see is people trying to put those lights up front and too low. A lot of times I get the lights and I get the gradients and get a white high so that I don't have that, that angle of reflection isn't bringing that back in, except maybe a little specular highlight on the neck of the bottle or something. I can deal with that in Photoshop. You know, it, it's kind of, um, I'm ruined for all kinds of media and movies and everything now, because all I do is like see all these problems <laughs> and stuff. So, <laughs> so I was teaching a, a 101 class here and we went right down the block to go get Subway and I was talking to the people I was teaching and showing them the pictures on the wall. And then I'm like seeing the product photography. I'm like, oh, 
Larry would, you know, say how to fix this and how to fix that because you just see like the whole soft box in this one and you see this and that one, all the reflections. I'm like, this is horrible. It's like a tomato this big and there's a soft box right in right. it and right. this is blown out and that the oil thing has, like you said, the labels ruined because it has the you know reflection right over well, it. And you, I'm just like, wow, this is really bad. Well, you and have so this, one bought it and paid for it though. Yeah, exactly. And they and they do. You see wine, whole wineries with all their bottles looking like that. And someone just had a, a setup. Even today when we pulled out the big six foot strop or even seven foot uh, strip box, they had grids on them. And that didn't work in it because all of a sudden you're seeing that right. grid and you had to pull that off. Even in the soft boxes, sometimes uh, uh, Tim Wallace is a very well known car photographer out there and He'll, they'll even iron or steam out those panels in the front because even those little wrinkles and lines can show up in the chrome or something. So oh, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is that not all of these shots are taken in one shot either. A lot of right. them are, are like multiple shots and composited together. So like they might shoot just the label yeah. and get the right. label perfect. Right. Then they might shoot just the highlights on the shoulders you know, of right. the bottle and get that perfect. Then, you know just the bottle cap and just the reflection so they'll take these 10 20 however many shots and then composite all the best parts to get that perfect it, it's really a big part of any product photography because there's a point where you're just going to spend too much time trying to light it perfectly as one object especially when you have multiple players on the stage meaning a wine bottle and wine glasses and a corkscrew and sometimes you've got to remove some of them, light each piece separately and just do that and and we talked the same thing today with the uh, part of this shoot with the motorcycle is that some of the solutions are going to be to get the models in there, get the shot of the motorcycle, then take them off the stage, move some lights around to get rid of those bad spots that are happening, right. and uh, and just come back in Photoshop, and that's the most efficient way. Yeah, I just saw um, there's a there's a commercial photographer that he just kind of did a promo for um, Pro Photo, but he was he was showing how he did his process, and mm -hmm. anytime he has people with a product. Yeah. He'll feature the product. He shoots the product separate yeah. with the people in it, mm -hmm. but then he'll relight it for the people and shoot the people separate yeah. as well. So it's it, you know because when on these shots, you know, in order to get the people to look really great, you got to bring those lights in really close. Yeah. But then your lights are in your shot. Right. So you're always like limited with the amount of space, and it doesn't even matter how big <laughs> your space. Big <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter how big your space is. At some point, you're going to have to put your equipment in the shot yeah. and then somehow work around it, too. So, that today. Yeah, and I think the other issue we're talking about is depth of field. When you're in close and you're shooting four, five, six feet away, even if you're shooting F-16, F-20, you are having depth of field issues a lot of times, especially if there's a bike back there and a couple of people in different places. And that may be a solution for multiple shots. Uh, in jewelry, we, we do focus stacking where we take multiple shots at different planes. Like I just explained as an MRI slices and putting them together as one picture. Yep. And that may be part of the solution. Backing way up is another another one. But depth of field becomes a real issue. And, and in um, jewelry photography, the other issue is in small and macro is scratches you think your ring looks beautiful <laughs> and you think that wine bottle looks great until you get in there and all of a sudden you see the dust, you see fingerprints because you didn't wear a glove when you handled the product. I mean, it's, it's a myriad of little things. that It's a very detailed profession. Definitely. Cool. So um, so we went over problems, we went over some lighting, depth of field. Um, how, how can we have some of these solutions and, and get better results for people out there that are maybe just dabbling in it you know, what's what's a few maybe top two tips that you can give someone for getting better, just to get that little bit better? Get training. Patience. Yeah. Get training. <laughs> Patience. I, I mean, you know, yeah. YouTube and that'll take you only so far. Sure. But at some point you're going to need some one-on-one. some one of it's wrong, too. Yeah. You have something right. that you follow that's very detailed, but YouTube, you go on it and it could be, you know, anything. Like, look at our show. Jeez. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, it's, I, I mean, it. We were talking earlier, you know, people think that they can sometimes go buy X amount of dollars in equipment and make, take great pictures. I mean, it's a very tedious... You put it on P for professional, no? Right. <laughs> P for professional. Yeah. You know, I mean... <laughs> Handles it all. Just, you got to keep going over and over and over. You know, we'll I mean, never be happy, I mean, because you do need professional training. I've joined some groups where I get training, I pay for that training, yeah. help me get better. 
people who are better than me or challenge me constantly. Right. And I challenge myself. And I'd say do self projects. I mean, you know, everybody we know is a pro says it has done it. Yep. You have lots of self projects you do. You design something, you shoot it, and you learn from every one of those. Learn you just from have mistakes to. and learn from yeah, right. the good stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that there is no real school for this stuff. Nope. I mean, I actually went and took photography in college. I got a minor in photography, mm -hmm. but they didn't teach you they you know they teach you the basics of what you need and whatnot they don't teach you what it takes to for this kind of speciality right. and that's what it is it's a speciality right. and if you want to specialize in something like product photography or whatever it is find someone who does it and learn from them and either the one on yeah get a mentorship or something right. go there and you know try to get someone to really walk you through and spend some one-on-one. -on -one well, in the old days, there was apprenticeships yeah. in most trades. Right. And that seems to have fallen by. But if you could be an apprentice to somebody, at least even part-time, find someone to let you come out and just be a grip and hold the yeah, lights. Carry stuff. Uh, carry you stuff learn more by carrying someone else's bags and watching them work than you ever Very will, yeah. you know, trying to watch some YouTube yeah. video, trying to figure this out on your own. Yeah, there's too much... Just divert, you know, the information is all over the place on YouTube. So I think that there are people online who are teaching and they're very credible and they, you can tell because they shoot for the major brands and they have a work that'll just blow your mind. Mm -hmm. And there's, and it's a broad field. It's in just shooting jewelry. There's all kinds of stuff out there. So, you know, we could go on for hours and maybe sure. we'll talk more about it in another episode. Oh, yeah. We're definitely going to get back into this. This is kind of just the, uh, you know, just getting into it and, and just trying to see what, you know, other people out there that may want to get into this. Again, we all think it's easy. When I started to look into doing some stock photography, it's like, oh, I'm going to do stock photography. And yeah. then you start submitting <laughs> stuff and seeing what actually gets submitted and what right. gets approved and what else is out there. And you're like, this is a full time job. I have to sit here every day and submit 30 images to every different one. And it's like, no, I don't want I don't want to do that. I want to take can stock. And some people want to do it and they love right. it and they're very good at it. I just didn't want to be that person, you right. know? So you have to see if this is something for you and if you're really into product photography. Well, yeah. it is tedious work, like Larry said. I mean, Larry and I came into this shoot today and we were thinking, okay, we'll have lights here, lights here, lights here. Light. And we ended up, the last shot was three lights. Yeah. We, one we, on we, each side, way soft, you know, so turn way down. And then one in the front. And we started out with seven or eight and thought that well, was yeah. going to be the answer. You know? Well, that was a different shot. We moved in close. It was very, we just, we had a whole series of ideas and you and every one of those had to, the lights have to change. And the whole concept, you just can't leave lights where they are and just change your right. positions on that kind of a shot. Sure. So me, I, you know, for me, I'm never happy with my product photography, even though it's improved greatly a year into it. I go back and look at the other ones. It's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> always, always. So, um, so let us know what problems you've been having in the comments. What ways you've solved those problems? If you have, if we've helped you at all. If not, you know, tell us you hate us and tell us why. So we'd love to hear all that stuff and put it down in the comments. Subscribe with the little red button that maybe you hear, here, yeah, here, or here. here. We're Ooh, really not sure. It's down. It's underneath right there. the it's bottom there. left. Oh, right, right there. <laughs> Over there. Right about there. It's here. So uh, we'll see you real Cheers. soon. Cheers. <laughs>